we don't always know who they are, and we don't always know um, the facts that surrounded their death. And so, Dr. Cheryl Johnston begins her work at the end, the end of life. This is uh, something most people don't ever see, and so it takes a special person to want to do this kind of work. And so, on a forested mountain slope near Western Carolina University's campus, behind chain link fencing topped with razor wire as well as wooden privacy fencing, Dr. Johnston uses forensic anthropology to give a voice to people who no longer speak. It applies anthropology and human biology to examine human remains, most often in criminal cases. A facility like this is necessary for us to understand how humans decompose, um, to understand if we're called into a case and there's a um, person who's deceased and they've been in the environment for a while, it's until now been kind of an um, educated guess how long they've been there. And so we're trying to refine that, we're trying to collect some data. Think you're done just about or you think that they're still, you're not down to sterile soil? All of, like yeah. there and down here, we hit hmm, stereo like soil. Here. Dr. Johnston is the director of the Forensic Osteological Research Station. It's one of only six facilities in the nation where researchers study human decomposition. Some of the remains come from people who individually donate their remains for research. Most of the remains come from family donors who either can't afford a funeral or are estranged from the deceased and don't know what to do with the person's remains. All of the bodies are respectfully laid to rest on the grounds of the facility, literally on the ground. At this point, we mostly put people on the surface to decompose. There are three burials right now in the facility. Most of the bodies of deceased donors are laid to rest on the forest floor, although a few are placed in shallow graves. There, they are exposed to all of the elements, from heat and humidity to cold and rain, and even wildlife. But the science is found in the natural environment. You know, if somebody decomposes in their clothed or versus unclothed, or covered in leaves or in brush or not, what, what are the differences and how, how can we learn to interpret um, a case, basically? There's a standard set of photographs we take initially. There's a, a form we fill out to score. We record observations and um, make notes about how we position them, whether they're clothed or not, things like that. Any kind of medical equipment we notice at the time or hospital bracelet or any, anything, we, we make note of it. And then we come back on an interval and, and repeat that and so that we capture a whole process of decomposition. Um, after the first few weeks it's daily and then it becomes weekly and then it becomes maybe t every two weeks and you know when you get into late stage decomp it's it's even less frequent and I'm trying to leave the um, people in the facility for a long time because it's that late stage decomp that's not as well understood as the earlier stages. There's a big old rock. I am looking for just bones that are left behind. Oftentimes the bones of the hands and feet are very small and they'll, they're easy to miss. And so after the main collection, we come out and um, trowel the soil down a little bit till we get to sterile soil, um, just to make sure we don't miss anything. Most of the students working on the research project, like Rebecca McCurley, are planning careers as crime scene investigators and forensic scientists. They know the work at the facility helps authorities understand what happens in real life scenarios, from accidents to crime scenes. Understanding the process of decomposition can help pinpoint how and when a person died and what happened to their remains after death. Everybody has the same bones, but everybody is different. And that seems so strange. Like, there are so many different things that make up a person and makes them unique. And so many of them are on the bones and they're defined. And it's just really interesting. So next to a surface grave covered in branches, grasses, and leaves, students set up a recovery plan for the remains in a grave that is almost two years old. That's about the time it takes 
for a body to decompose, leaving nothing but bone. Students mark out a grid and use archaeology field techniques to systematically scrape away layers of soil. And then, like, you know, if we find something that is in that 10 centimeters, then we'll trow down further. So it's not just, oh, look, I found something else. I'm going to take it out and stop. It's you continue going until you don't find anything. Keep looking. The geography of the area and its vegetation are noted along with the location of the bones and changes in soil color and compaction. You don't want to miss anything. It's very important not to miss any remains that you can possibly get. Some skeletal remains are not big enough to actually see with the eye unless you sift through the dirt. We did an inventory inside and we're still missing some skeletal elements, so we're just coming back out and making sure I didn't miss anything. See right down in there? You can mm -hmm. just barely see it, but it's closed. Okay. I mean, it's complete. Okay, so it's Students follow the bones and the process from start to finish, from the forest to collection to cleaning, processing, and cataloging. The remains are curated and cataloged at the Western Carolina Human Identification Lab. There are 206 bones in the human skeleton. Each one is studied and recorded and each bone has a story to tell. Researchers are learning more and more how better to tell the story. We don't always know who they are, and we don't always know um, the facts that surrounded their death, and so if foul play is suspected, it's not always foul play. People wander off and get hypothermia, but um, it's useful in identification to know approximately how long ago a person um, you know, showed up in the environment as a dead person. One thing that I think is very important when I'm dealing with students and law enforcement and dog trainers and everybody is that we never forget that that's a person. That it's somebody who's got a family and friends who are probably still out there someplace and um, I, I don't like to let go of that. There's, I've been criticized a bit because it, people say, well, that's not very objective. Well, it's not, but this is the kind of research where you have to balance objectivity with respect and with ethical issues. And so um, I use Mr. This or Mrs. That or Ms. That, and you know that's how I would address that person if they walked into my lab and I was meeting them for the first time.